Hi everyone, so in this video I'm going to be discussing about the Ethiopians and the Hebrew Israelite movement. So I'm just going to take a look at some sources. The founders of the movement, we look at Arnold Josiah Ford, born April 23rd, 1877 to September 16, 1935. And um, it says that he was recognized as a pioneering figure of the Black Hebrew movement. And if we take a little bit of a look into his biography, we see that he was influenced by Ethiopia. Um, it says right here that he co-authored co the Universal Ethiopian Anthem with Benjamin E. Burrow. He published the Universal Ethiopian Hymnal in 1920. And it says, following Garvey's arrest and conviction, Ford founded the Beth Benai Israel Synagogue in a Harlem storefront and declared himself to be a rabbi. In 1930, he and a small group of black Jews went to Ethiopia, where they participated in the coronation of His Imperial Majesty Emperor Hale Selassie I, the um, first, created a school and acquired 800 acres of land for the purpose of uniting black Jews of the diaspora with their brothers already in Ethiopia. Um, so he is one proponent of the leading figures behind the Black Israelite movement. Here's the front page cover of the Universal Ethiopian Hymnal with a picture of Arnold Josiah Ford on the front. See, it's Arnold J. Ford, Arnold Josiah Ford. And when the people who started the movement, the Hebrew Israelite movement, they first started with the goal of prophecy, fulfilling prophecy, understanding the scripture, seeking the face of God. Over time, certain groups become dogmatic and become sort of pseudo-religious cults, and they take on a, a life of their own and drift away from the truth. With Arnold Josiah Ford, as I said, he went to the coronation of His Imperial Majesty. He got land in Ethiopia. I mean, a lot of these people, the forerunners, they were really committed to finding the truth and being a part of God's king, the kingdom of God. And this is why you had people like Arnold Josiah Ford repatriating to Ethiopia. And in videos, we'll discuss about the ancient Israel, Israelite kingdom being located in Africa, specifically East Africa. And this information, along with the video prior that was already made, you can find with, that talks about His Imperial Majesty being in the Bible that we can find him reference in the scripture through the line of Judah and Revelations and Isaiah, prophet, Isaiah, the prophecies of Isaiah and other parts of the Bible as well. So this brother and other and the other brothers and sisters that were part of the, the, the early movement when it started, they were in the truth. They understood, they knew where Israel was located. They understood their heritage, who they were as Hebrew Israelites. And they understood who His Imperial Majesty was. As I said, you can listen to one of my other videos that I just made not too long ago about His Imperial Majesty being in the Bible. Um, we can see that there was a group, ben, Beth Shalom Benai Zakin Ethiopian Hebrew Congregation. Um, another one that sticks out is the Commandment Keepers. Let me see. And one of the founders, or we could say actually the founder of the Commandment Keepers, a Black Hebrew congregation. And just to give context, these are among the the progenitors of what we would consider modern Hebrew Israelites. Um, even when we start looking at you know groups like One West. Um, a lot of these came from these original Hebrew Israelite 
movements. You can see right here, one West camp. Um, but let me just get into a little bit of Wentworth, Arthur, Matthew, um, because I do, I think that one West actually came from commandment keepers. Now it says that Wentworth was a West Indian immigrant to New York city was founder in 1919 of the commandment keepers of the living God, a black Hebrew congregation. And, um, it was influenced by Pan-Africanism and Black nationalism of Marcus Garvey from Jamaica. Matthew developed his congregation along Jewish lines of observance and the theory that they were returning to Judaism as the true Hebrews. And let's go down a little further and see what else it talks about. So it talks about his immigration. Um, let's see. All right, so it says right here that he founded the commandment keepers and we know that he was influenced as it says up top by marcus garvey but if we look down here it says when he learned about the beta israel of ethiopia he began to identify with them and just to take a look at beta israel those are ethiopians who are classified as descendants of the israelites and it would make sense that he would identify with them because it's as it says right here in Isaiah 11, 12, and he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. So Wentworth Arthur Matthew understood the concept, this concept of the diaspora. And because as we said, he's one of the original proponents who started the Hebrew Israelite movement and he picked it up from the Ethiopians. Now it says that from then on as you start developing the philosophies many Hebrew Israelites would later carry on such as the observing the dietary laws um, like it even says the name is commandment keepers. So to follow all the commandments and the laws and another aspect that has been forgotten by people, I would say primarily at the one West camp was that he thought that white or European Jews were the descendants of Khazars. In this presentation, I cover Khazar and the word Khazar, it comes from the peoples that were living in the Khazaria region. And that is located in Central Asia and parts of Eastern Europe. And the peoples that came from that region descended from Ashkenaz. And as you can see right here in Genesis chapter 10, 2 through 5, Ashkenaz was the grandson of Japheth. But just to read in full, it says the sons of Japheth, Gomer and Magog and Madai and Javan and Tubal and Meshech and Tyrus, and the sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, and Rephath, and Togarmar, and the sons of Javan, Elisha, and Tarshish, Kittim, and Dodanim. By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, every one after his tongue, after their families and their nations. So now you can see right here Ashkenazi Jews. A lot of Jews are Ashkenazis, and the Ashkenazis came from the Khazaria region is where they started to build their name and they are descendants of Ashkenaz who was the grandson of Japheth so they all descend from the line of Japheth now there's a prophecy regarding Japheth in Genesis 9 27 and I'm gonna go let's see what it says in Genesis 9 27 God shall enlarge Japheth and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servants. Now, this sounds fine and dandy, except for the part where it says Canaan shall be his servant. That's, uh, you know, something to raise alarm. Well, why does it say Canaan will be his servant? Because technically, when we look at it in the terms of a family, Canaan would have been the nephew of Japheth because Canaan was a descendant of Ham, who was the brother of Japheth. But... Before we even, um, that's something that can also be talked about in another video. Just to highlight this part that many may overlook in large 
if we look at the meaning of enlarge, it comes from the word pota. And how do I get there? Well, you scroll down, this is Bible Hub. They'll go into the Strong's meaning of it. And Strong's just gives you, because a lot of these words have meaning, the Hebrew word for enlarge, when you look at, if we go to the origin of the word, what the meaning is, is pata. And pata, right here, you can see pata, also pronounced pata. Pata. The word means entice, deceive, spaces, open. It could mean persuade. And you can see right here, to be deceived deceive, seduce. You can see that there's a lot more negative connotations applied to it than positive. So if we're looking at it in the context of, well, it's saying that they will be enlarged and they will dwell in the tents of Shem, then we can see that it can also mean that the, that the descendants of Japheth deceived the world and took the tents of Shem and made Canaan their servant. Because obviously we can see that there's something at play that's not, you know, in terms of a kumbaya sense. So God allowed Japheth basically to run the world. As it says, God shall enlarge Japheth. So Japheth would take the tents of Shem. And as it says right here, through deception, right here, through deception. And if we re if we go back, just go back quickly to the presentation, you can see right here that the people that we see now walking around claiming themselves to be Jews did in a way take the tents of Shem, because if we look right here, just to go back, the descendants of Shem are the Israelites. Israelites descend through Shem through Jacob, Isaac, Abraham, Terah, going all the way down to Shem. And then you have the descendants of Japheth, where you have Ashkenaz. So now we see that they're portraying themselves as the Israelites and fulfilling Genesis 9:27. However, we know that ultimately, as it says in Revelations, that God knows that these people who say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan, how God is going to punish them. So all those things will be taken care of by the Lord, who's going to have events take place, such as Armageddon, that is going to take away power from the Gentiles that they have used, such as the horn that it says, these are the horns which have scattered Judah so that no man did lift up his head, but these are come to fray them to cast out the horns of the Gentiles, which lifted up their horn over the land of Judah to scatter it. So as I said, God is going to destroy their power and we see it happening right now. So as the Israelites, more Israelites start to wake up to who they truly are and start coming together, we're going to see more um, events happening. So, you know, this is just what I wanted to cover. And then, you know, as I said, here's some more pictures of Wentworth Arthur Matthew. You have the Royal Order of Ethiopian Hebrews, Inc., which is... Um, the organization that he played a part of in establishing. And you can see is, you know, that's when they start going back to Sabbath, keeping the Sabbath holy. And, um, you know, you can see all the congregants there, him holding the, the laws, the, the clothing attire with the women, keeping their hair, their head covered. And, uh, you know, then you have the picture of, Emperor Menelik II, who was instrumental in defeating the Italians at the Battle of Adwa during the First Italo-Ethiopian War. So, you know.
just goes to show you how closely connected the movement is and it is still to this day connected to Ethiopia because that's where the land is at. Original people who had started this movement, how they did their research and looked at things not from a subjective standpoint, but to finding the truth. And they did. You had those that were in the movement that understood that the Holy Land was in Ethiopia, in the East Africa region, because that's where ancient Israel was located at, in um, northern Ethiopia, parts of Sudan and Eritrea. And then also, you also have the factor of His Imperial Majesty fulfilling the prophecy with Arnold Josiah IV moving to Ethiopia and witnessing the coronation of His Imperial Majesty and understanding His Imperial Majesty's role in fulfilling the prophecies in the Bible and how the, with Wentworth Matthew, that the people who say that they are Israelites, most of them are descendants of Ashkenaz. And then you also had the aspect of, you know, with Arnold Josiah Ford moving and getting land in Ethiopia for the Israelites from the diaspora to repatriate, understanding that he didn't go to Demona, Israel, like you had some groups of, like I said, how the Hebrew Israelites started to branch off factions that believed that the Holy Land is in the Levant region of what we consider the modern day state of Israel, but the true kingdom of Israel they understood was in Ethiopia as it's the actual location of the original kingdom of Israel being in that region of Ethiopia, parts of southern Sudan and Eritrea. Now you see some say that the white man is an Edomite and we can see that obviously there's some and we'll discuss like the the fragmentation that happened that caused the split where you have people ultimately we have this the a central idea of who the hebrew israelites are but as different groups started to branch out the truth became lost um because even if you do want to say they're an Edomite, it even says in Deuteronomy 23, 7, 8, Thou shalt not abhor an Edomite, for he is thy brother. Thou shalt not abhor an Egyptian, because thou wast a stranger in his land. Well, isn't that interesting, the two that they use? Egypt, you know, being a Hamite, and then an Edomite, which they classify as being a white man. And then it says, the children that are begotten of them shall enter into the congregation of the Lord in their third generation. And you have so many that swear up and down that every single law we need to follow from the Old Testament to the New Testament and all around, all over. Yet, some people may decide to just exclude this because, well, this isn't a law. When clearly it, it is coming from the scripture, the word of God, saying what we shouldn't do. So it's basically giving us a commandment, a law that we should keep. But like I said, there, you know, there's some that just don't listen to reason and they'll find every other excuse to fit things, their narrative. The point of the point being that if God, whatever conflict God has with Edom, how he talks about he was going to destroy them, that's God's business. It's not for us to meddle and try to take on that retribution. If he doesn't tell us we should go out and fight them, then it's not our battle. That's his battle. So a lot of people try to carry out the wrath of God, not realizing that, no, you're not the most high. God tells us the way we should act, and God acts the way he acts. We are his creation. We are not the creator. So he gives us this law, it's a law that we should follow. We shouldn't say, well, he says he doesn't like them, so now we shouldn't like them either, because it clearly says in Deuteronomy 23, that's not the case. I just wanted to touch upon that a little bit, but like I said, I'm going to go back to where I was at before. But this is just going to show, you know, as I discuss the 
the transformation that's happened over the years. Not all Hebrew Israelite movements, because as we can see, there are several, and even more than just what's listed on here. And it's unfortunate that, you know, some of the Hebrew Israelites take a negative outlook on Ethiopians and Africa in general. Um, it says rabbis order, when it regards to his legacy, rabbis ordained from the Israelite Rabbinical Academy in Brooklyn have become spiritual leaders of black Hebrews in, numer in numerous cities. For instance, Capers Funny, Funny Jr. of Chicago studied with and was ordained by Levi Ben Levi, the spiritual leader of the Hebrew Israelite movement in Brooklyn from the Commandment Keepers tradition. In 1985, Funny started as an assistant rabbi at the Beth Shalom Ben Zanat Benai Zakin Ethiopian Hebrew congregation in Chicago, which he now leads. So you can see that, you know, a lot of these people, you know, Ethiopia clearly had a, had a huge effect on the Pan-African movement. It says right here, um, Capris Funyi, he's still alive, um, leads a 200-member Beth Shalom Benai Zakin Ethiopian Hebrew congregation of Chicago, Illinois. So he's still alive and, um, you know, it, it, once again, it says, you know, Fungi became drawn to the more conventional teachings of a black Brooklyn-based rabbi named Levi Ben Levi, the chief rabbi in the, of the International Israelite Board of Rabbis. This group has its roots in the Commandment Keepers, Congregation of the Living God, founded in 1919 by Wentworth, Arthur, Matthew, and Harlem. So it looks like over time, Funyi diverged and started to become more affiliated with the Khazars. And um, I guess this is just a part of the, the falling away people that came in to truth when there were people that were the actual leaders who had kept the vision of Hebrew Israelites forming their own organizations, coming together as a people, fulfilling the prophecy. And once those leaders pass on, you have other people that try to be like leaders that end up falling off the right path and as it shows with this guy, how he, instead of taking the role of the head, looked like he took the role of the tail, according to Deuteronomy 28. Instead of focusing on us having our own things, our own organization, and not to say that we restrict other races or other groups of people, but that we form an organization or that we become affiliated with organizations such as the Ethiopian World Federation, become affiliated with those organizations or craft the or or craft an Ethiopian um, Hebrew Israelite Urban Affairs or Congress instead of joining under the American Jewish Congress and the Jewish Council of Urban Affairs, which are which is basically run by Khazar Jews. It's going back to Deuteronomy twenty eight curses that. You would be the tail and they would be the head. You would just be a follower, someone that goes along and gets along. And as I'll discuss in another video, where the Deuteronomy 28 curses are over. There's no reason for us to have that mentality. And even back then, there was still no reason for it because we had the Ethiopian World Federation. So, you know, this just goes to show, you know, how, what happens to some people that become part of an organization and they're not fully emancipated from Babylon. And we can take a look also at some other information. For instance, there's a book called The Ethiopian Manifesto. Let's see. It's a pretty interesting book. It doesn't get too much into Hebrew Israelites, but it was made in 1829. 
um, by Robert Alexander Young, a slave preacher in defense of black man of the black man's rights. Um, let me see, the black man rights in the scale of universal freedom. Young addresses both black and white people. Young identifies African diaspora Jews living outside of Israel as Ethiopians. He tells Ethiopians they only enjoy a few of their birthrights because some are enslaved. He writes to Ethiopians and all slaves in hopes of making them aware of how mistreated they have been. Young questions how his skin color plays a part in making him eligible for God's gift. Um, and this goes on to other things. But again, this was just going just goes to show you that, you know, Ethiopia has always played a central part in um, in our push for liberation on a spiritual level and also on a physical level. Um, so let's go take a look at the commandment keepers. It says the commandment keepers, well, the full name is commandment keepers, Ethiopian Hebrew congregation of the living God pillar and ground of truth incorporated, um, that follow the view that people of Ethiopian descent represent one of the lost tribes of Israel and that King Solomon and Queen, and Queen Sheba and that they are descendants of King Solomon and Queen Sheba and believe that the biblical patriarchs were black. And this group was founded all the way back in 1919. So, you know, we see the book, uh, such as the Ethiopian Manifesto that was written in 1829. You have the Commandment Keepers in 1919. You have Josiah, um, Arnold Josiah Ford, born all the way in 1877. So, I mean, this, it just goes to show you that, you know, a lot of the doctrines, like it says right here, um, one West camp, you know, a lot of people are familiar with this because they're, they practice open air preaching where they'll be sometimes going back and forth with people on the street, telling them about, um, Edomites and, how Africans are Hamites, how Ethiopians and people will be slaves. And it's just funny because when we look at One West Camp, again, it goes back to here. The founder of the first grouping of the movement was Eber Ben Yaman, also known as Abba Bivens. And who, um, Abba Bivens, who quit the Judaism related commandment keepers of Harlem in 1969 to start a group based on the 12 tribes doctrine that portrayed a critical view of normal normative normative Judaism Judaism so we can see that even the guy that started the whole one west camp really was just a splinter from the commandment keepers so this is just it's it's just really interesting you know how he basically came to the commandment keepers took their doctrine readjusted it to his own viewpoint to to draft the 12 tribe of doctrine not to say that it's all completely wrong but you know it, it just goes to show well look where you, where did you guys first start out at where did you get your your um your philosophy from where was it built on and again it, it comes down to the commandment keepers which then goes back to ethiopia and this connects to 1 john two nineteen where it says they went out from us but they were not of us for if they had been of us they would no doubt have continued with us but they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us and then in the next verse because this this is talking about beware of antichrist but ye have an unction from the holy one and ye know all things so what does unction mean? It's saying that the unction is an anointing, a special endowment of the Holy Spirit. So the people that really do stick with wanting to know the truth and not so much preaching about the destruction of other groups of people and that, you know, only this one group is, is, is eligible for salvation. I mean, we just have different viewpoints, but altogether we can see we can see how this connect how that connects because the the word of God is profitable for for instruction and for edification and for growing spiritually, physically, mentally, emotionally, and all things.
So even something like that, even though it may not seem like it's it's applicable to this scenario, it is, because we can see how the the how these different camps started from Ethiopia, which is this the the forebear of this, and you know so. We take a look. We took a look at that, and we can just. And this was just a video, just to to show the connections um, between the Hebrew Israelite movement and Ethiopia. Now, I'm just going to go ahead and go over some some other verses that I believe sometimes is often used to try to discredit Ethiopia or put them into a negative light. For instance, Isaiah 45, 14, thus saith the Lord, the labor of Egypt and merchandise of Ethiopia and the Sabians, men of stature shall come over unto thee and they shall be thine. They shall come after thee in chains. They shall come over and they shall fall down unto thee. They shall make supplication unto thee saying, surely God is in thee and there is none else. There is no God. Um, but again, it's all about context, because if we read the prior verse to that, it says, I have raised him up in righteousness, and I will direct all of his ways. He shall build my city, and he shall let go my captives, not for price nor reward, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, who is this person that is letting the captives go? Well, if we can even look from the title where it says God calls Cyrus. He's referring to Cyrus, the king of Persia. For instance, let's go visit 2 Chronicles 36, 22. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith the Lord, thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth hath the Lord God of heaven given me, and he hath charged me to build him an house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? The Lord his God be with him, and let him go up. So we see, just as we were at the keeper in the gas, the Lord picks people who is ordained by him to rule the nations. He decides where the Ark of the Covenant goes. He decides who the chosen families are. Sometimes we like to go by our feelings, not realizing that God, that God operates on an entirely different level than our level of understanding. So a verse that some people may ascribe to, well, this is being referring to the Israelites, does not refer to the Israelites at all. This is not the Ethiopians and other nations bound down to Israel. As it says right here, Cyrus, king of Persia. So, so we can see that Ethiopia at some time in certain points of history were had become tributary states. In certain points of history, had fell under the subjugation of other, of another nation, had been punished. Because again, no nation is perfect. Even if the Ark of the even if that nation has the Ark of the Covenant, as we see with Israel, Israel was still punished with famine. It had been punished with captivity. Another thing we also have to realize is that during the time of Cyrus, let's look at when Cyrus was around. When was when did he reign? Cyrus the Great, King of Persia, says he lived around 600 to 530 BC. He reigned. Like it says he reigned from 559. 530 BC. So around that time period, 600 to 500 BC. Now, if we go back during the time of Solomon, we see that Solomon reigned about 
970 BC to 931 BC. So we can see that there's more than 300 years have passed because if we say that Sol, well, we know that Menelik was the son of Solomon, so he would have reigned around in the 900 BCs. So again, that's over 300 years that have passed from Menelik when he first receives the when he when he goes to visit his father and then is anointed and returns to Ethiopia to begin the Ethiopian Solomonic dynasty. It's been 300 years, so we know that no no human being is perfect. The Ethiopians made mistakes, just like the Israelites made mistakes. That doesn't deny the fact that they are still the children of God, as we even see in Amos 9-7. Something, again, other certain camps like to try and discredit and make excuses, however, it clearly states Amos 9 7, Are ye not as the children of the Ethiopians unto me, O children of Israel, saith the Lord? And then it goes on to say, Have not I brought up Israel out of the land of Egypt and the Philistines from Kaphtar and the Syrians from Kerr? If we look at the beginning, we can clearly say, see how he's discussing, confirming how important the children of Israel are by comparing them to the children of the Ethiopians. Notice it says children, children, a sign of endearment, of endearment, of closeness, of us being his children. So if he's calling the children of Israel, it doesn't say children of the Philistines or the children of Syria, of the Syrians, but he says the children of the Ethiopians and the children of Israel. Well, why is he calling them children? Because he, we are his children. The Israelites are his children. The Ethiopians are his children. So he's confirming how much he loves Israel by comparing them to another people who belong unto him, which who are the Ethiopians. So even though the Lord chastises and he punishes, he still loves us. So here I'm just pulling up some verses. Um, for instance, Hebrews 12, 6, it says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Remember, son, what does that mean? Children, just as I said before about the children of Israel and the children of Ethiopia. So now when you see it says chasteneth, what does it mean? It means educate, discipline, punish, instruct. And then for the word scourgeth, it means to flog. Flog meaning to whip misfortune, plague, sent by God to punish and to discipline. So you can see here that when people sometimes look at other nations um, suffering, not realizing that sometimes the Lord does that in order to teach them a lesson. So now let's take a look at one more chapter. Zephaniah 2. If we go down to the 12 verse, it says, Ye Ethiopians also, ye shall be slain by my sword. Now, why? Why is he saying, why is the Most High saying this? Well, if we go and we start from the beginning to understand the full contents of it, gather ye, it says, Zephaniah 2 1. Gather ye yourselves together, yet gather together, O nation not desired. Before the decree bring forth, before the day pass as a chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you. Before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you, seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. So now I just want to take a look at the Strong's Zephaniah 2, which is the same exact thing, but they have notes that help describe um, the meaning of certain words. For instance, let's take a look at what meek is. Meek, gentle, and gentle in the mind, humble, lowly, meek, poor. These are types of attitudes that the Most High wants us to have, to carry, and how to treat each other because it says, all ye meek of the earth which have wrought his judgment seek righteousness. So in righteousness, 
It's talking about equity, prosperity. It's how to treat each other because like it says, it's, it's, a, it's a moral, it's, it's also has a moral application to it. So when it talks about equity, that's just how we treat our brother and that's how we treat other people. So now, so why, how do we apply this to the contents of the verse so that we can get an understanding of what it means when he says that he's going to slay the 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 Ethiopians are going to be slain by his sword. Well, if we go back, we'll see that the Mosai talks about punishing Gaza. They'll be forsaken. Ashkelon will be a desolation. Ekron will be rooted up. Now, if we go a little further to the tenth verse, because all these you know follow in the same pattern, it says this shall be. This shall they have for their pride, because they have reproached and magnified themselves against the people of the Lord of hosts. The Lord will be terrible unto them, for he will famish all the gods of the earth, and men shall worship him, every one from his place, even all the isles of the heathen. So these are all the people that came up against God, God's people, the Israelites. Because we got to take this into the context of it, that he, right now he's talking to the he, now right now he's talking about the Israelites, his people. So we got to understand the historical events that some of these things have already happened in their own time period. And that has already happened in, in, in our history. And we just went over that by going over Isaiah 45, where he talks about Cyrus, who would execute this judgment upon, as it says right here, the merchandise of Ethiopia, and it says that they shall be thine. They shall come after thee and change. They shall, in chains, they shall come over and they shall fall down unto thee. They shall make supplication unto thee, saying, Surely God is in thee, and there is none else. There is no God. Now, when we go here to Zephaniah, it says, The Lord will be terrible unto them, for he will famish all the gods of the earth, and men shall worship him. Everyone from his place, even all the isles of the heathen. I mean, you know, we can clearly see it says, surely God is in thee, there is none else, there is no God. So they're making supplication. What is supplication? The action of asking or begging for something earnestly or humbly. It's a plea, it's an appeal, a petition. It can also mean prayer which is exactly what it's talked about in Zephaniah when it's referring to the Ethiopians, how they will fall down and worship God. Because altogether you have different periods of time where the Lord's people fall off the right path and God has to punish them. He has to chastise them. He has to scourge them, just as we talked about. And these things have happened already. So a lot of people will take these verses out of context and say, oh, well, this is to come for them. They'll fall down at our feet. They'll go ahead and bow down before us. They'll be our slaves, not realizing that God has already executed judgment on these people. Just as he's executed judgment upon us.